Chapter 10. Beneficial Outcomes for Humanity in the Smart Technology Era. Part 2. Problematic Trajectory of Our Current Civilization in the Smart Technology Era. Of the many well-informed and thoroughly researched perspectives about the state of our civilization and our current trajectory, I found the one presented by Daniel Smachtenberger to be not only thoughtful and insightful, but one that we should pay attention to, even though I do not agree with every aspect of this. Daniel's core interest is focus on long-term civilization design, and more specifically to help us as a civilization to develop improved sense-making and meaning-making capabilities so that we can make better quality decisions to help unlock more of our potential and higher values that we are capable of. He has specifically done some work on surveying existential and catastrophic risks, advancing forecasting and mitigation strategies, synthesizing and advancing civilization collapse and institutional decay models, as well as identifying generator functions that drive catastrophic risk scenarios and social architectures that lead to potential coordination failures. Generator functions include, for example, game theory-related win-lose dynamics, multiplied by exponential technology, damage feedback loops, unreasonable or irrational incentives, and short-term decision-making incentives on issues with long-term consequences. He believes that categorical solutions to these generator functions would address the causes for civilization collapse and function as the key ingredients for a new and robust civilization model that will be robust in a smart technology era with destabilizing decentralized exponential technology. Daniel has shared his views on the Civilization Emerging website and many podcasts such as Rebel Wisdom, Modern Wisdom, The Portal, Future Thinkers, The Seeking, The Nantucket Project, Neurohacker, Tom Bilyeu, Foresight Institute, and Max Hug. In a podcast titled The 2050 Life Purpose Podcast, Building a New Civilization, Daniel Smachtenberger answers questions on his life purpose and his goals for the year 2050, which is in part paraphrased below. He summarizes his main sense of purpose is helping to transition civilization being on a current path that is self-terminating to one that is not and that is supportive of the possibility of purpose and meaning for everyone enduring into the future and working on changing the underlying structural dynamics that help make that possible. What he would like to see differently within the next 30 years is that we prevent existential risks that could play out in this time frame. It is not a given that we make it to 2050. Apart from catastrophic risks that can play out over this time period, there are those that can go past a tipping point during this time frame but will inevitably play out after that time. As we do not want to experience civilization collapse or existential risk and also not have us go past tipping points, Daniel would like to see a change in the trajectory that civilization is currently on from one that is on the path of many self-terminating scenarios, each with their own set of chain reactions, such as AI apocalypse, World War III, climate change, human-induced migration issues, leading to resource wars, collapse of biodiversity, and killer drones. More broadly, some of the key categories of risk can include human system failures, such as economics, government, infrastructure, emergency services, and communications, violence, such as war and terrorism, exponential technology risks, such as those from AI, biotech and nanotech, and exponential disinformation, ecology risks, such as climate change, coral die-off, ocean acidification, ocean dead zones, industrial and agricultural pollution, desertification, total biodiversity loss, overfishing, species extinction, Keystone species loss, weather intensification, Arctic methane, aquifer and freshwater depletion and toxicity, sea level rise, droughts and ocean current changes, human health related risks such as mental health, toxicity, deficiency and fragility and pandemics which could be natural, engineered or accidental byproducts of biotech and planetary natural disasters or exoplanetary events. The problem is that we have a civilization that is generating most of these scenarios at increasing speed and magnitude. 
As a civilization, we need to switch off that path to one that is developing all of its technological capacity for omnipositive purposes in the world at large. In a future thinker's podcast, Singularity or Extinction, Exponential Growth is Not Forever, Daniel explains further the problem that we are trying to fix. He reckons that the current systems, the interface of these systems with each other, and the net effects are unsustainable, which leads to a self-terminating scenario where these systems run to their own end and then fall off some kind of cliff. When we look at growth curves of different kinds of organisms, any time we see a growth curve that has an exponential up, that is not forever. Sometimes the exponential up goes logistic, meaning a sigmoidal or S-curve, and that is typically good. Sometimes it drops off pretty hard before it follows a logistic path. Sometimes it goes through a lot of instability, and sometimes it just drops off a cliff. As an example, the world's population was less than 500 million people for all of human history, as far as we know, until we got to the Industrial Revolution, where after just 200 years, we went up to over 7 billion people and growing. That is an extreme exponential curve. Daniel makes the point that not only have we gone through this extreme exponential population curve in relation to our ability to extract resources from the planet that are not replenishing themselves, which is what the Industrial Revolution was, such as mining, farming, fishing and logging. We are also taking resource reserves that took hundreds of millions or billions of years to develop and extract them at a radically fast pace, much faster than they can renew and have a world population that is growing on that savings account. Real problems start when we hit the end of the savings account. Not only have we been growing in population, but we have been growing in resource consumption per capita within an economy that requires year-over-year -year growth. He argues that this kind of exponential growth economy, which is attached to a linear materials economy, just does not work ongoingly on a finite planet and will effectively lead to a self-terminating situation. He understands why we took this route in picking so much low-hanging fruit in terms of coal, oil, fish and trees to initially help drive our economy, but states that it is just not viable anymore. One counter-argument for the limited resources of a finite planet can be that mining space would unlock tremendous resources, although it would likely have a dramatic impact on capitalism, which amongst other things capitalizes on scarcity. There are also more sustainable ways of working with resources in a balanced way, such as the development of subterranean aquaponic fish farms that, if done correctly at scale, could help to provide food to the planet's people or harvesting bamboo or trees in a similar fashion. In the podcast, the 2050 Life Purpose Podcast, Building a New Civilization, Daniel Smachtenberger desires to see a prototype of a new full-stack model of civilization that has in its design categorically solved the generator functions of all the catastrophic and existential risks and is a civilization model that is moving into one of increasingly quality of life and is actually more adaptive than the current civilization, so it becomes a new gravitational basin for everything to flow. So, Daniel thinks that this specifically requires new economics, new governance, new law, new jurisprudence in philosophy as a basis of law, new judiciary, new medicine, new infrastructure, new technology development processes, and a new culture with a sense of what is meaningful and purposeful. So, what is being suggested here by him is a full-stack reboot from an axiom level. He argues that if we think about all of the existential risks that the generator function have in common that is driving all of these risks, we see things like if we have a rivalrous or win-lose game or an in-group-out-group dynamics where they compete and they cannot both win, then harm definitely happens from that. So the implication is that my win requires your loss, and we are seeking harm directly, and we are both extracting more resources from the environment, or externalizing more harm to the environment, or indirectly doing that through the harm that happens through war. It is evident that we are harming each other and harming the commons. With exponential technology, which means exponentially increased capacity to affect the world through our choices, to the degree that we are making choices that are directly and or indirectly harm-causing, exponential harm-causing choices, self-terminate on a finite playing field. 
So, for thousands of years of civilization, we have killed people who had different ideas than us and who had a reasonable way of dealing with problems. We also had unsustainable agriculture that deserted areas that were previously arable. This is not a new phenomenon, as desertification is a thousands of years phenomenon, and we have had extinct species for a long time. Daniel also thinks that the existential risks that humanity face now are not different in kind, but are different in magnitude and speed and driven by exponential technology, which is technology that makes it easier to make better technology and computers that help make us better computers. It seems clear that exponential technology will not be put back in the bag and is going to happen. He argues that exponential technology multiplied by rivalrous game theory self-terminates. Therefore, we must create anti-rivalrous environments that make us safe stewards of the level of power that exponential technology brings, or the human experiment completes in a metapoetic sense. He thinks that exponential technology is bringing us to have the power of gods and that we need the love, wisdom and prudence of gods to guide the use of that power or irresponsible use of that power would end up self-destructing. So, the question is, what does this look like? The focus is to solve the rivalrous games generator function. Daniel argues that creating an anti-rivalrous environment is clearly changing the macroeconomics of having a balance sheet that mirrors the scorecard of a finite rivalrous game and requires not having in-group and out-group like nations or religions or race identification in any deep kind of sense. These are significant changes and require not having things like democracy where we make a proposition that is ill-formed. If such a proposition goes through, it benefits something and harms something else. And if it doesn't go through, then something is protected and something else is harmed. If it goes through, it could, for example, lead to groups of people with specific needs clustering more around one side versus the other, which now creates polarization and eventually radicalization, which then needs to be stabilized in war. However, we cannot keep having wars because exponentially increasing military technology becomes unwinnable. So, creating an anti-rivalrous environment is complicated. Even though humanity has not done this before, we must do something because every civilization that we ever had so far has collapsed. But now we have a fully global civilization where the collapse is actually catastrophic. When Rome fell, it was substantial, but it was not the whole world. The same holds for the Inca, Mesopotamia, Sumerians and other civilizations. Now we have a fully globalized supply chain economy that is also connected to the biosphere in a deep way that its collapse is actually a catastrophic collapse. Given that these systems always fell for these reasons, we must do something that the world has never done before. We also have increased capacities that the world never had before and we must realize them and then also guide the other capacities that are coming on board. So, the reason he is saying all of this is because creating an anti-rivalrous environment does not only prevent existential risk, it also changes the underlying rivalry basis of humanity's whole history of fighting wars, torturing one another, damaging the environment, making philosophies with respect to the nature of duality, and creating a mixed bag that humans are based on game-theoretic dynamics. There is also a question about how the distribution of moral values have shifted over the centuries for humans and if it has been positive in all respects. Daniel feels that we can create a different environment that does not incentivize harm because as long as one person is incentivized to do something that is harmful to another person, it cannot be prevented at scale. But we can actually change that underlying incentive and make it to where yours and mine are more tightly coupled and yours are mine and the commons are tightly coupled. In his mind, the outcome is not communism or socialism or anything that has ever been presented. It is something totally new and there are real paths to this. In the process of solving the generator function, we are not only solving catastrophic risks, but also the bad human dynamics and bringing about a really radical different human being. Daniel also realizes that there will be a transitional path to such an idealized destination. For example, if we have an intentional community today that is trying to prototype some ideals, but they still need to get the computer that they have to buy from Apple, which needs to get minerals that comes from conflict zones and rainforests over six continents, 
and is made in factories where workers do not commit suicide about working and living conditions that is bad, then our village is still being supported by the tragedy of the whole rest of the thing. So according to him, we will not avoid the above type of scenario until we get to an advanced technology closed-loop civilization that does not require import and is actually more adaptive than the previous civilization. That happens at the scale of an advanced technology city-state, which needs to be sovereign in law and the minimum kind of scale for self-organization that could actually produce all of our needs. So in 2050, Daniel would like to see a fully operating city-state civilization model that is anti-rivalrous and has the right relationship between complicated and complex systems and all the other dynamics that we need. You would like to see it operating long enough and well enough that the rest of the world is already starting to move in the direction that it is setting an example of, and that means also off the path of existential risk. Although I think there is a lot of merit in such a city-state civilization model, as well as infinite games dynamics, which is part of the solutions framework that the book also recommends, I'm not convinced that we can or need to completely eliminate rivalrous dynamics on certain levels within society where it does not cause harm. I will elaborate later in this chapter. Daniel expands further on the city-state civilization that he envisions by affirming that the generator functions with their many different expressions must be solved at that level, otherwise we do not really move or change the future possibilities. We need to articulate that solutions at a generator function level are not only necessary for civilization making, but also sufficient. We then need to develop architectures for viable solutions that entails an economic system, a governance system, and a legal system that avoid these problematic generator functions and generate fundamentally different behaviors. So, a city-state civilization needs to understand the nature of the problem well enough to categorize the design criteria of the solution and then start to develop actual instantiations of solutions that meet those design criteria. Next is starting to prototype governance methods that they have developed to see if they do what they think they will do and refine them. For a city-state civilization to operate smoothly, Daniel expects that people will also need to be trained on how to administer it, run its new type of economic system, and govern it with different roles than what we are used to in the current civilization setup, where we have politicians, lawyers, judges, and bankers. So, he pictures a whole new civics, new things that people need to be trained on, and a new process of technology design for how to do technology that does not produce toxicity issues and externality. This means that we need a lot of people working on components of this, getting trained on those components, who would then be able to build the city-state at scale and populate it to begin with. There is deep enough training that will have to happen in immersive environments, which means that communities, villages, places where people are actually together, working on training in these new skills and capacities that will then be able to boot the city-state. However, it will initially not be a closed loop and still require getting into an airplane to fly somewhere or buy a computer from Apple, but they will be developing some of the capacities necessary to build a civilization without those dependencies in the long term. So Daniel recommends working on a full articulation and description of the design criteria that are necessary so that other people can also play with those ideas and see if those design criteria make sense to them. If they agree with their analysis and work on those things independently, they can start to instantiate those ideas to evolve it towards a full-scale prototype and then spread that prototype. The prototype does not only have to solve the generator functions, but also must be anti-fragile in the presence of the fact that the rest of the world is still rivalrous. He states that this new system also must be autopoetic, which means that it should be able to reproduce, maintain, expand and propagate itself, which are all part of the design criteria. As everything needs to be built from scratch, he thinks it is a good thing to have many different groups of people working on various areas such as coral reef issues, carbon sequestration issues or AI risk issues as long as they have a path to make meaningful progress. The assumption is that many people are working on many important things that are part of the same project on a meta level that brings the current trajectory of civilization to a better trajectory. 
Whilst those big projects are happening, we should still continue with essential tasks such as raising our children, taking care of the elderly and growing food. It is important for as many people as possible to understand the problem and solution space that we are operating in. Daniel also takes the position that we will not survive as a civilization if we do not fix our individual and collective sense making. We know from history that every empire breaks down at some point in time. From his perspective, we are now in a fully globalized system that is in the process of breakdown. When all the previous systems broke down, they were all localized. He thinks that our current civilization will not continue to just influence the world in a positive direction and is decaying into just less function and irrelevance or possibly into a reboot. For the latter, a cultural prerequisite is necessary where everyone recognizes that collective choice making must be based on collective sense making. This means that we need to really invest in doubling down not only on our own biases, but also our capacity to be good at making sense of things, to understand why people are thinking the things that they do, and to communicate well so that we can coordinate. It is clearly not easy to fix collective sense making, and we have more work to do to figure this out. It is imperative that we need more collective intelligence working on various aspects of the collective sense making solution. This implies that we need more people to understand how much this affects most of the other problems that we are concerned about, how it is upstream to those problems, and what factors are contributing to it. When we consider the commons, we think of the shared aspect of the world that is both a resource that we have access to, but also one that we need to take care of. Daniel makes the point that the same holds for the information commons, which should be the space of our information out there about what is true that informs our capacity to make choices. However, what we actually see is an information commons that looks like a smokestack bellowing pollution into the air, as most of what is being put into the information commons is pollution. If there are large groups of people that one only has derogatory strawman versions of, where one cannot explain why they think what they think without making them dumb or bad, one should be doubtful of one's own modeling. To fix this, Daniel recommends absorbing the news that they are taking in for a day or a week and try to ascertain what the real issues are that they are facing as human beings if one really puts oneself in their shoes. The reason for doing this is not just to empathize with them, but to determine if there is some actual signal that one might be missing. Most of the positions at the moment seem to have some signals and lots of noise. In order for us to synthesize the signals across the space, we would need to seek to understand other human beings with whom we are coordinating and get the relevant parts of their signal as we try to separate the signals from the noise. Daniel makes the claim that if you feel a combination of being scared, outraged, or emotional and very certain about a strong kind of enemy hypothesis orientation, it is likely that you have been captured by somebody's narrative warfare and you think it is your own thinking. He believes that even if you win at a local battle, whatever social, information, or other technologies that you use to win, the other side will reverse engineer and come back and just escalate an arms race. So, we are in this case not really moving towards real shared sense-making and coordination. This does not mean that you never take a position. It means that you are trying to take a position that is not just continuing warfare, but trying to elevate the whole space, which requires for me to understand the whole space better. For any particular issue, there might be multiple narrative clusters, each containing many different narrative versions. What Daniel typically does is to first take a landscape of what the narrative clusters are and then try to steel man each narrative, like what is the strongest version of arguing that thing that he is able to see. One thing that he does is to look for the best thinkers that are representative of those narratives. In addition to reading across the space, he also recommends to truly seek the most well-grounded and complex views as opposed to the more trending ones. He wants to find the thinkers that seem most earnest and most well-educated and thoughtful across the space and then look for people that have deep expertise and earnestness and disagree with them in order to explore the basis of the disagreement. 
He encourages people to seek to understand the narrative landscape better on their own, to seek empiricism better, to attempt to not object or take entire narratives, but be able to look for partial truths, to try and aggregate signals across the space, and to be way more comfortable with uncertainty even though it can be uncomfortable. For any well-functioning and effective democratic society, it is essential for as many citizens as possible to have high-quality sense-making and discourse. U.S. President Thomas Jefferson was very aware of this when he said, If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. In order to help accelerate a cultural movement toward much improved sense-making and conversation, Daniel Smachtenberger and others have recently founded the Consilience Project, which is a non-profit media organization that has a goal to assist with the repairing and rebuilding the health of the information commons by helping educate people on how to improve their information processing so they can better detect media bias and disinformation while becoming more capable sense-makers and citizens. This would also help to reduce tribalism and divergence and help people to have more effective collaboration in solving problems based on a higher standard of public sense-making and civilized conversation with integrity and good intentions. Wikipedia defines consilience as the principle that evidence from independent, unrelated sources can converge on strong conclusions, and that when one have many sources of evidence that are in agreement, the conclusion can be very convincing, even though the individual sources of evidence might not have a strong conclusion on their own. The project itself brings together a new approach to establishing news and educational resources for public information through a content strategy and a movement catalyzing strategy. The content strategy involves a new form of news that optimizes for accuracy and bias correction, a type of meta-news sense-making about what is going on within the media landscape and education in crucial sense-making skills, media literacy and civics. The movement catalyzing strategy entails sense-making forums, curated resources and innovation prizes for well-defined public sense-making and discourse-related projects. The University of Oxford, supported by Templeton World Charity Foundation, has produced a report, Citizenship in a Networked Age, an Agenda for Rebuilding Our Civic Ideal, to help the discourse about citizens' moral decision-making and what it means to be a good citizen in the digital AI-driven network age or smart technology era. The authors Dominique Burbich, Andrew Briggs and Michael Rees have made seven main recommendations in this regard that require strong collaboration between stakeholders such as government, industry and citizens. These recommendations include identifying and protecting the uniqueness of humans with respect to moral decision-making, cultivating and developing complementary skills of humans and machines for collective decision-making, working towards collective agreement about civic ideals for the AI-driven networked age, teaching how to improve listening as a civic virtue, helping us to think before we speak or instantly respond, promoting the value of privacy for personal moral development and revaluing and appreciating democracy with respect to its ability to help create social unity and trust. They advocate that AI and other smart technology should be in service of human moral decision-making and human judgment of the moral whole, where the moral whole of the human community plays a key role in forming a sense of the common good, meaning and purpose. We need to keep in mind that our consciousness, our mortality constraints and self-awareness of our mortality makes us radically different to machines with respect to goals and moral decision-making capability on an individual and society level where participation in decision-making is a key privilege and a responsibility to our collective citizenship. They observe how the character of citizenship is changing in the smart technology era, with AI-driven networking technology changing how people interact and impacting the relationship between the individual and society. We are seeing how AI-driven applications such as search optimization and classification are evolving into respectively influence optimization and learning to decide and optimize. We therefore must be wise in how we use technology to help us make better decisions in support of improving good citizenship 
aid our new kinds of communities and institutions that are being formed, deal with citizen privacy in a special manner that protects what is important and significant to a person, and support democratic decision-making that seek consensus in the context of distinctive and often opposing interests.